Now, why the change of the sermon this morning? Well, this has been something on my mind for some time. Obviously, being as astute as you are, you know I haven't spoken at 9 o'clock, it seems like, since the Lord was resurrected. And Jordan has been most gracious to share the 1050 with me while I worked through a series of lessons. But there's something that's been rattling around in my mind for some time, and it was kind of put in perspective this morning as Jody and I were coming to, to the building. We were pulling out of the neighborhood, about to take a left on Elm, and there was a father that was pushing his little baby girl in the carriage. And the father was just pushing along, steadily walking, and the little baby girl was just leaning back with one arm like this, her pacifier in her mouth and one leg propped up like that, and not a care in the world. And the thing that moved me back to the thought that I've had for some time is I want to visit with you about some things that flow out of three different passages this morning. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. He says in verse 3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making a request for you all with joy. Turning to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 3. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 2. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, patience of hope in our Lord, and our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God, our Father. Did you get the common thread in those three passages? There was a thankfulness that Paul had for the brethren, Philippi, Colossae, and Thessalonica. But it wasn't just a thankfulness for them, it was a thankfulness for their faith in the Lord. Their gratitude, his gratitude for their work in the Lord. And what I want to visit with you just a little bit about this morning, this is just, just us talking together here and hopefully reminding us of some, some things, at least reminding myself. I realize, I realize that the series I did at 1050 was laborious to work through. If it was laborious for you to listen, it was laborious for me to develop and to preach. I think it was necessary, however, because of things that happened in our religious environment today, to be reminded of some things. But I think also we need to be reminded we can preach of things other than that. And there are things that are equally as important as that. And to be reminded of those things, and I think a part of that is to be reminded of the blessings and the gratitude we have, not only for the Lord, but that we should have for one another and the blessings that we have because of Him and because of one another. It is to state the obvious to state that 2024 has had its challenges for this church. In a personal way, Jody and I have had some health challenges through this year. We came out of 2023 with some challenges for Jordan. We've also had some challenges that people have left, and they've gone to local churches that we would prefer they not go to because of, of the standard of God's Word and the standard of authority and things that might be different there, but they made their choices to go, to go there. It doesn't mean that they're bad people. It doesn't mean they're ugly people. It means they made a choice different than what I personally would have made because I can't support where they went to from the Word of God. But I don't have to answer for them. You don't have to answer for them. They have to answer for them before God. And then we've had people that have left for various reasons. Some moved, some for other reasons. And it's always kind of a hit in the solar plexus. Whenever we have a group of people we're trying to mold together as one, and for some reason somebody leaves. And it just kind of leaves a bad taste in your mouth because we want everybody to be here as one and everybody feel enfolded together. And so we recognize that church, churches go through problems. 
an old older preacher, Brother Floyd Thompson. I know many of you may not know that name. At one time, Floyd was a very prominent preacher among our brethren before his death years ago because of pancreatic cancer. I remember him saying, the life of a church is kind of like your knuckles. It's kind of up and down, up and down, up and down. And that really is the life of a church. And the reason it's that way is because that's the way the lives of people who comprise the church are. Our lives are not a straight line. It has the, the dip, the high and the lows of our knuckles in life. And because we have those as people comprising God's church, we have those as well. And sometimes it's just so easy to be fixed on all the negative things that take place. And once we make that, once we make that, that decision about negative things and then let it affect everything, it begins to affect everything else we do and the way we look at everything and everybody. We then begin to look at like there's, there's a communist behind every door Figuratively speaking, there's a problem, there's a bad guy, there's a bad girl, there's a bad person behind every door. You better watch it. We become cynical. And we become jaded because of the many problems that seem to overwhelm us and become blind to the fact our Father is pushing us in a carriage and we get to sit back with a pacifier in our mouth with our leg propped up and live great lives. Because if we really, really stop to take an inventory of our lives in the inventory of this church, I think we would have to all admit there are a lot of things that are going great more than there are things that are going bad. And we need to remember that as a congregation. This is not about me versus you, you versus me, you versus each other. This is about we're all, we're all united at one place. We're all united at the foot of the cross. And it's the man hanging on the cross that's the center of our attention. But when I let something that has adversely happened to me begin to affect me, and I drop my head and start doing navel gazing, focusing simply on myself, I fail to look up and see the man hanging on the cross, not just hanging there as a piece of human flesh to rot, but hanging there for me and hanging there for you. What problem do we have that could possibly be greater than him hanging on a cross for me and for you. What problem could possibly, that we could have in life, ever have in life, that could transcend what that is? Even the greatest loss we could suffer in life, what could possibly transcend what he has done for us? Life under the sun has its knocks. Life under the sun has its flea bites, it has its ticks, and it has its warts. Life under the sun was never portrayed by God as being just a piece of sunshine, sunshine every day and everything, the wind blowing at our back all the time. In fact, more often than not, the pictures presented in the Bible that, that life under the sun has adversity to it. That's why, as we were reminded this weekend, count all joy that you have trials, not because it's hee-hee-ha-ha, I can't wait for another one, but because it's a byproduct of it. There's something that develops in us when we do go through those kinds of trials in life. Each of us have our own. Each of us have our own problems. As Tim Jennings said Saturday afternoon, we all have our own sack of rocks. Remember D used to say that. He said, I'm my own sack of rocks and I'm just trying to carry them the best I can. And what we do, don't we? Your sack of rocks are different than my sack of rocks and, and vice versa. I, I, I know you, you know me, but I really don't know what intimately is is rattling around in your brain and, and, and affecting your heart. You don't really know what's rattling around in my brain affecting my heart. But the thing that brings us together is gratitude for our God. And Paul could say, the brethren at Philippi, and there was a problem in Philippi, as good a church as that was. 
Evidently, there were two women who couldn't get along, and he asked the brethren there to help those women get along. But still he said, I'm thankful for you, and I remember your faith. In Colossae, they had Gnostics coming in, and they were challenging the faith of people. But yet Paul said, I remember your faith, and I remember your work. In Thessalonica, you remember how Thessalonica began? He got run out of town on a rail. He was about to be tarred and feathered until he was pulled into Jason's house, and then they wanted to tar and feather Jason. He goes to Berea and has a whole lot better reception, but yet the gospel succeeded at Thessalonica, and he thanked God for their work, and because the gospel succeeded at Thessalonica, the gospel spread through all roads going east and west because all roads east and west ran through Thessalonica. The gospel had its success. Because we are beset with adversity does not mean the gospel's failing. In fact, it may be quite the opposite. It may be because we're having adversity is a sign of the fact that our lives are trying to be righteous lives and Satan has his bow set for us and is firing his darts at us and he's trying to hit us any way and every way we can. Because after all, why would he fire a dart at somebody he's already got? Right? Why would he try to slay somebody that's already in his lap? And as far as Satan is concerned, each one of us is lost because he lost us, because God's grace was greater. I want us to think just a little while about the blessings that we have. First of all, if you have a surviving parent, if you have a surviving parent, I would ask us, regardless of how old, how infirm, or how much they struggle to get around, thank God for them. Because those of you who know, who've lost both parents, know that time comes in which you can't pick the phone up and talk to them anymore. It may be hard to hear them. Years ago, I was with Roger and Don in, New, in uh, New Albany, Indiana. It was the year we did the lectureship. Jordan was training there with his dad. And both had lost their parents. I said, fellas, both of y'all, well, Roger had lost his mother, not his dad at that time. I said, you, you both have experienced something I haven't experienced. Can, can you help me with this? Don said, the thing I miss the most is I can't pick up the phone and call and talk to my dad. You know what I miss the most? I can call my dad. It's hard for him to hear. But I still have my dad. And that means when he comes and he sits with me and Jody, problems he may have, I'm thankful he's sitting there and singing. I can't take my eyes off of him singing. I want to challenge you, first of all, if you have a living parent, you be thankful. If you have a living mate, please be thankful. Because sad though it may be that you, many have lost a mate. You know the pain and the emptiness that comes with that. That partnership has been severed and you know the loss that you feel that. But living life with a mate, sometimes we take for granted. I say this not in boasting. I don't remember the last time that Jody and I fought, but my, our mantra about that is, listen, we're both about to be seven years old. We don't have time left to fight. There's not enough time left to fight. If you're 30 years old and you're married, you don't have enough time left to fight either. It's just not worth it. It's not worth picking each other, at each other. It's not worth denigrating each other. It's not worth finding fault with each other. It's not worth criticizing each other. It's not worth being negative with each other. Be thankful for the mate that you have that will help carry you, that will help hold you. And if all your children are still living, and you be thankful. Again, those who've lost children know the pain and the loss. I can't describe that. I don't feel that. And it may, it may, it may even be that you have a child that's wandered away from the Lord, but you still have that child in the flesh. And as long as you have that child in the flesh, though that child has wandered away from the Lord, while there's breath, there's always opportunity. Don't give up on that child. You have that child that God blessed you with. You pull that child old or young. I don't care how old they get. 
don't care how they get. When you, you pull them in and you hug them close and you tell them you love them and that you're proud of them. Yes, they may have made decisions you don't approve of, but that doesn't stop you love from loving them and doesn't stop the fact you can still be proud of them for who they are. Mistakes, though they may be. I'm afraid sometimes as parents with children in the home, and I plead guilty to this. I was so busy being a daddy. I was so busy making sure they did what was right and making sure they did what I told them to do that I did not appreciate the fact I had them in the home and did not accentuate their positive attributes while accentuating all the negative things. Listen. Parents, I say this because I interact with your kids. I know I'm 70 and I'm supposed to be too old to interact with your kids. But listen, I interact with your kids. Janice and I are teaching a junior high class right now and it is a blast. we got some lively ones in there. But there are some great kids here. And I would tell the parents here, don't get so wrapped up in the fact you're trying to raise your kids and correct your kids. Yes, you have to do that. That you fail to look at them in the face and just love them. And when they get older, and you have to call them and say, can you come help? It's their turn to hold you up. The third thing, maybe fourth thing I want to challenge us to think about is let's be thankful for the blessing we have of a local church like Campbell Road. This is not a perfect congregation because none of us are perfect. I like what Brother Robert Turner of years ago used to say, if you find a perfect congregation, they wouldn't have you because you'd mess them up. And that's true. And I plead, I, I plead guilty to be the least, most, most least perfect person here. I, I, know, I know my flaws and my foibles. I look at them every day in the mirror when I stare at myself. My wife could accentuate them many times over because she's known me since high school. But listen. Even with the problems, even with the challenges we have sometimes at a local church, there's some really good things going on here. Can I share those with you just a moment? Can I share some of those good things? Let's just start with what we just had. We just had a great men's weekend, a study in the Bible. We opened the Word of God and studied six lessons from the book of James. That's phenomenal. And people were encouraged by it. That's one thing. We have groups that try to do different things and involve people in the different groups. In the deeper study group, we're going through the book of Proverbs, and I'm not picking the Proverbs. The class, the people in the class are picking the Proverbs. And the last one we had, we went through some Proverbs. They were great. And we had great interaction. September 22nd. Tom and the singing group has invited everybody to come here at 5 o'clock. The singing group, can, you can come in and you can sing and rejoice with the singing group. He's opened the doors for all of us to come. That's great. We have a service group. You know what some guys did in the service group this last week? Well, Jansen acts like he's hurt. That means he can't mow his yard. He has Brian Turquette, who is the guy that takes care of the service group, can you get some guys to come help me mow my yard? You know who the guys are that came help mow the yard? Brian and Ethan. Here's Ethan. Came and helped mow the yard. That's awesome. That's awesome that, that here, Brian took his son and said, we're going to go serve somebody and help. You think about the encouragement group slash enfolding group. And you think about how, how that group goes about helping and encouraging each other. And noticing each other, notice the people that, that come that are new and help the people that are hurting. And the prayer group, that Conrad Tabor, who was born here and grew up here, is now helping in the prayer group and helping people in the prayer group. He's been trying to be very diligent helping with that. Kevin Shortley did a great job of that for a while. We have people praying for one another here. That's awesome. Are you aware of that? And they're asking for people to pray for. 
They're not sitting on, on the bench saying, okay, we're the prayer group, come tell us. They're asking, can you give us people to pray for? And you look at the back of the personal there, and you can have all the people you want there. We've got a lot of people here that need praying for. Praying for. We've got a lot of people here that need thanksgiving because of the healing that's taking place. Got some great things going on with the groups, guys. Ladies, ladies, brethren, got some great things going on here. But they're only as good as we are. They're only as good as we are, they're only as weak as we are. And so my encouragement to you would be don't miss out on some good things that are going on here because it's awesome. It's awesome to have that smaller group arranged with people where you can really interact. And after a Bible study, like we do a deeper study, we sit down and we have a meal. People bring different things. And Jody always orders pizza. And most everybody likes pizza. If you don't, we got chips. To, to, you can eat chips. People come and they enjoy. And, and they stay and they stay and they stay. Sometimes we want to go like this. we got to go to bed. No, that's not true. We love it when they stay. You ever notice what takes place when things are dismissed here? You can't get out of the building. The foyer's jammed. There are people gathered around here because they're talking. You know, I, I know years ago, the thing was, when you come into this auditorium, you need to be quiet and you need to be reverent and you need to be silent. And they used to be smart and have this little sign at the back that said, remember Lot's wife. Number one, that was the dumbest thing we ever came up with. And then it said, okay, be silent. You're in the temple of the Lord. That was the second dumbest thing we ever came up with. Listen, when you come in here before you start, you talk. Talk. You share your lives with each other. When it's time to quiet, we'll quiet. And we'll get down to what we're going to do. But when you come, engage yourself with each other. This is not a funeral home. We're not having a funeral. We're having a celebration. We're having a worship. Reach out and visit with one another. But can I encourage you to do something about that while that's a good thing going on? Can I really encourage you in something here? Again, I'm not trying to dig anybody. I'm trying to help us here. While we're involved visiting with one another, can we, is it possible is it just possible we can lift our eyes off of ourselves in our little pod to see the person standing by themselves, to see the older person trying to make it up the aisle, to see the guest that we always say we're welcome to have and you're a special guest, and stop and engage them and then say, I'll get back to you in a moment. Can I go talk to this person here first? And make sure we follow through on what we say when that guest has come, that we really do make them feel welcome. I'm not going to tell you who, I'm not going to tell you where. But this past month, I had the opportunity to speak at two different churches. One, the auditorium was full. And the other, the auditorium may have had 20 people. I would love the invitation 10 times to speak at that group that had 20 people. Over one more invitation to speak with a group that had a full auditorium. I was the guest speaker. And I was a piece of carpet. A few said something. In that group of 20... Everybody was glad to be there and they appreciated the work that was done there and the effort that was made to encourage them. I don't ever want anybody, I don't ever want anybody to leave this, this building feeling like they're just a piece of carpet because here's why we're better than that. We are better than that. And we know better than that and we, will, we can do Better than that if we will do better than that. I know people come and they say, this is a friendly church. 
People come and say, this is not a friendly church. And what I want to ask is, the church that you came from, was that friendly? If they say no, I say, well, that might be an indication of something then. He that be friend, he must have friends must be friendly, right? In some ways, the friendly part depends on the attitude of the person. I love Miles for a lot of reasons. Not the least of which he's strong enough to help Jansen on the stage. <laughs> Listen, Miles came to us from, from, a, from, twin, from, a, from College Station slash Twin Cities. Miles hasn't sat on the bench and done nothing. He has engaged himself here. Tip arranged a men's study on another good thing, a men's study on Thursday night. He got involved. He just come as a graduate from a university, fresh out and doing nothing, sit in a building of over 400 people and say, I'm here. He got involved. That, that's, that, that's what we're saying here. There's always something for somebody to do to get involved here because there's always so many good things taking place with people here. You know, we have people hurting for a number of reasons. Not always help. Sometimes we have marriages struggling for different reasons. It's not always physical. It's not always intimate either. It's just they're struggling and taking place. And you know what? We have people who have the ability to reach out and help them. This church is filled with people who have the ability and experience to reach out and help people in marriages who are struggling. And sometimes we have young people who don't feel like they have a spot. And you know what? we got people here who know how to help a young person find a spot. And sometimes we have older people who don't feel like they matter anymore. And guess what? We have young people here who help older, can help older people feel like you're still valuable to us and you still have a spot. Because everybody has a place here. You may not feel like you do, but I'm telling you. Everybody has a place here. Everybody can have a role here. And you are welcome here. And we want you to know you're welcome here. And we want you to know we want you here. And we want you to be part of this group because people, be, people will care for you here. Sometimes, though, I kind of feel like we're, we're like a family in this way. Terry used this illustration yesterday. There's four brothers in the family. And uh, he was talking with a preacher one time. He said, oh, y'all were the battling Bennett's. He said, what do you mean? He said, y'all are always fussing and fighting. Isn't that what brothers do? Fussing and fight? But as Terry said, but the one thing you didn't do was you didn't pick on one of the others. So if you picked on one of the brothers, the other three were right there to help them. And you know what we do sometimes? We kind of go back and forth like this at each other. But then let something happen. And you can't have a house full enough to take care of them. I've seen over the years, this church, when people have hurt whatever variety you want it to have, people stopped this, and they started doing this. They rallied. If you've been a recipient of that, you know that. Jody and I, to a fault, are way too independent. And finally, we had some people who just forced themselves on us to bring us some food or to help us in some way when we were invalid here recently. And I tell you what, our hearts are filled with gratitude for those people that forced it on us. Because we really were still able to do something, but they said, no, we're going to do something. You know, somebody reaches out like that and forces it, they, you love it like that. The reason I always get up here and tell you this, I love you. Jody, I love you with all of our hearts is because when I look at this church, serious, serious, I really don't see the problems. Now, if you ask me what they are, I'll tell you. I, I make the list. I don't see the problems. What I see are the blessings. What I see are the opportunities. What I see are great people. People who sometimes have problems. Listen, when you've been a part of a church that's 20 people and they're struggling just to make ends meet, when I finished, we went over to the preacher's house. We had a little meal together. And as I was entering the house, one of the men handed me a check. I said, no, no, I don't need that. I'm good for this. I'm good for this. 
I don't need that. The contribution on the board was $750 for that week. They gave me $300 for expenses. That meant if it came out of that, they had $450 left for the week. He said, no, we have an obligation. It's important for us you take, for you to take this. Now, have you been a part of that? Ever been a part of that? And you come here, and we're wallowing in the wealth of treasures of people in every way you want to talk about it? We have nothing to complain about. All we should ever do is say, when I see you, I see a blessing. 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 And when I see you, I see blessings. If we kept that mindset for us, how would that help us? How would that help us? I wonder if it would change our mind about sometimes with people whom we feel like we have fallen out with. There's nothing that's ever happened to fall out with somebody that cannot be resolved that cannot be corrected, that cannot be forgiven, that cannot be overcome. The cross conquered all that. And so here's my closing thought to you. Paul said, I thank God upon every remembrance of you for your faith and for your work and your labor of love. Let's please, I beg of you, let's please, let's not lose sight of all the tremendously good things that are taking place in this church. And let's praise one another for those things. Let's acknowledge those things to one another. When you see a good, compliment it. When you have a criticism, do this. Just keep it to yourself. Because the only person you're going to help with that criticism is you. Because I don't care how we frame it. I just want to help you. It's a criticism. It cuts. And you walk away thinking, well, just do this. But what's a good thing? And you pray. Can we pray? Our blessed God and Father, we're so very, very thankful that you have given us to each other as a local congregation. And that by your grace and your mercy, you have enabled us to come together with one heart, one soul, and one mind. Yes, there's a varied number of people with varied, various mindsets, various thoughts, various convictions, and various opinions. But dear God, we're gathered around your grace and your Son at the foot of the cross with one heart, one soul, and mind because He is the center of our attention. And dear God, may we never forget this world's not our home. And that when we have a congregation like this, it's just, it's just, it's just a taste of heaven. And yet, that small taste is nothing to be compared with the greatness of gathering around your throne with all the saints of all the ages, the 24 elders and all the angels to sing. Worthy is the Lamb. Thank you. Thank you for this people. Thank you, dear God, for the common faith that we share and for the labor of love we enjoy with one another. Thank you. Will you please sing with me? God is so good. God is so good. God is so good.
have our closing prayer and closing song. Thank you for connecting with us this morning. We're so thankful that you were able to do that. If you have questions, we'd love to have the opportunity to talk to you. You can contact us at www.thebibleway.com or questions at thebibleway.com. Questions at thebibleway.com. We'd love to have you in person. Come if you can, but thank you for connecting with us.